Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Ocean State Current Command Bunker. Now playing from in the dugout, number 37, Mike Stenhouse. Today on this Wuhan Wednesday, we again explore the pattern of deception by the progressive left. That's what Wuhan Wednesday is all about. It started with the government cover-up and the media cover-up of the uh, Wuhan laboratory that we all know now launched the um, uh, COVID pandemic. But we've broadened it out to mean all false narratives pushed by the government, pushed by the left, pushed by those who are separated from reality. So this this pattern of deception, if you look just a little bit under the covers, you'll see this pattern of deception is present in almost every argument policy push by the left. More on that in a second. Welcome to In the Dugout, your host, Mike Stenhouse here. Really, really excited for today's show. First, a little commentary. Uh, I had an opinion piece uh, published in the Providence Journal over, over the weekend on Sunday, if you saw it, having to do with green energy, the latest, the, well, not the latest, the longest, I should say the longest running and probably most decept successful deception uh, the left ever put out. And now the newest thing is everybody needs to be driving electric vehicles. So go to the Providence Journal. More on that in, in just a second. Um, so, so we're going to be exploring both in my opening commentary here in just a minute and with our very special guest, Alex Epstein. If you don't know who Alex is, he is the world's foremost expert and philosopher when it comes to climate change, when it comes to energy, when it comes to fossil fuels. I can easily say he's the world's foremost advocate or most well-known and well-quoted and most interviewed advocate when it comes to promoting fossil fuels and why they're not so dangerous and why they actually have been a major benefit to huma humanity, to the flourishing of humanity. So Alex will be my guest uh, to close out the show. We got a good half hour interview with him. So please uh, stay tuned uh, and watch that. But first, uh, let me open, let me broach the topic by exploring, you know, a couple of more of the false narratives having to do with global warming and climate change. Uh, you know, one is that climate change is an ex existential threat to humanity. And of course, the one, I, as I explored in my opinion piece, and I'll talk about with Alex, is uh, how, uh, whether or not electric, the, the myth that electric vehicles is going to save the planet somehow and be good for, for Americans. Um, I think most Americans now realize what we've been saying since we started the Ocean State Current that um, there's a left-wing Fed, taxpayer-funded, if not taxpayer-coerced, uh, media machine, advocacy movement, political, po politicos, political supremacists. It's a machine that is increasingly churning out false narratives, untrue narratives, based on myth, based on nothing, based on outright lies, and that completely ignore science, that completely ignore history, um, and completely ignore common sense. And that's what Wuhan Wednesday is all about, is to expose some of those myths when we have that kind of uh, special. Uh, so this, so we we find as Americans, as Rhode Islanders, we're being taken up and down on this. They're trying to they're trying to do this roller coaster of emotions. Oh my God, you got this threat, you got that threat. This group of people are being victimized that way. This group of people, and we can do this, and we need to do that. None of it is true, and it's all about trying to create an environment where they can advance their agenda as the solution. So, first of all, neither, as we'll talk about today, neither is climate change an existential threat or carbon emissions an existential threat to, to uh, humanity, nor are electric vehicles the answer. Um, and then, of course, the truth. Part of that is not only to advance false narratives, but to bury the truth, uh, to pretend it doesn't exist, to just flat out say it's not true, 
uh, or to just be completely non-transparent, stick your head in the sand and just pretend that the truth isn't there. I mean, take the Washington Bridge example here in Rhode Island. The 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 incompetence, the corruption, uh, the special interests, just just rake in the money for providing no credible service in return. It, it's been like pulling teeth to try to get documents because they want to cover up the truth. They don't want to be transparent. So as long as we have people in power in our politics, on our televisions, in the media, advocacy groups who are in power, who believe uh, that it's best not to be honest with the people and they can say and do anything they want, they can create any narrative they want, even if it gets to the level of, of uh, corrupt allies, insider cronyism, Anytime you hear that whole movement, political, advocacy, grassroots, media, academic, all getting behind a theme, you can pretty well now expect that that is a false narrative, a false argument they are creating. There's no question about that. It, it's the pattern. It's the pattern. Because they can't tell you the truth. The truth does not support their narrative. It's up to people like me and others nationally who, who do it much on a much grander stage than me to try to sift through it all and to give you the truth, which is what we're, we're going to be about today. They can't tell you the truth because it's suicidal to their narrative. They can't tell you the truth because you would never vote for a politician who would support that. And it's all about winning elections and, and, and owning seats of power. They own the territory. We, as conservatives, as common sense, patriotic, God-fearing Americans, we need to start taking some territory back in elections and appoint appointments, whether it's a dog catcher, or a school librarian, a public librarian, a corporate board seat, whatever it is, elected officials, Hollywood producers, book writers, media personalities, we have to start taking back the content because we have the truth. Well, the truth is obvious to everyone. Well, it's not obvious to everyone. The truth should be obvious to everyone if only it gets has a chance to get out there. And this is the left's job is to keep it out there. But ultimately, it is up to you, the voters, to hold the media, not just politicians, but to hold the media accountable. Don't watch the shows. Don't buy their products. Don't vote for their candidates if they're continually lying to you. Now, one such one such uh, lie is, you know, the whole question of global warming and electric vehicles. Um, so what I want to take you through, I'm going to take you through some notes, and I'm going to tell you right up front that I'm paraphrasing some um, some uh, an email newsletter that was sent to me by our upcoming guest, um, uh, Alex Epstein. And he is he just makes so many great points. Before I get into my op-ed on electric vehicles and before we get to our interview with him, let me just set the stage and go and go over facts that are irrefutable, right? That may that I hope um, you know, I hope will set the record straight. So, you know, he asked the question, what should govern all of this? I'm gonna say is is based on his notes. At, mixed in with my commentary. I'm not going to do quotes all the time. Just know that this is based on Alex Epstein's uh, newsletter. When it comes to how should the uh, government ad address climate change, you know, it, it's really not the right question to ask. Climate change always happens, always has happened. The question is how the question should be, not, not that we can end climate change. <clears throat> the question is how can we reduce climate danger how do if there is going to be climate change how do we save ourselves from the effects and and the argument is uh well fossil fuels have already done that air conditioning heating the homes heating our cars powering businesses allowing pumps to irrigate fields i mean whether they're gasoline or electric power or hydraulic power or whatever whatever it is fossil fuels and nuclear fuels to a lesser extent have allowed us to reduce any negative effects of the climate, whether it's changing or not. So reducing climate change is the wrong question. It's reducing climate danger. And again, fossil fuels have been the most abundant and cost-effective way that mankind has ever found to protect ourselves from the climate. 
So government should readjust its sights. No question. We have mastered how to deal with the climate that Mother Nature has, has dealt us right now. We, we have. Even, even um, but we'll get into the warming in just a second. Um, but we have, you know, with all those machines and technologies I just mentioned and many more, we've mastered the climate challenges we face as a world. And we will continue to master them. That's the right target. That's what government should be doing. The, the current policies they're on now are impossible to reach and will only make us more susceptible to the climate because carbon emissions are not the problem. Here, here's more where Epstein goes in. Um, yes, the world is warmed about one degree Celsius, but you know, that's not a bad thing. And it's kind of slowed, if not flattened over the last 10, 20 years. You can, there's a lot of data on that, but Nobody's suffering. Nobody's uh, nobody's in being incinerated. We don't see the shores uh, flooding, uh, except for when there's a big rainstorm. And there's always been rainstorms and floods, but the ocean or oceans are not overtaking land masses. And that one degree increase has actually been good for the world. More more rain a little bit is good for, to, to when you when you want to try to grow things and 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 then the slight slight warming means there's more arable land, more land that can be farmed throughout the world. You can't farm in frigid, frigid, nasty, cold, cold weather. Um, so <clears throat> so um climate safety, though, is the question. And that's dramatically, we've dramatically become more safe as, as a humanity over time um, because we, we have the technology powered by fossil fuels to overcome changes in our climate. Even, even disastrous storms, we can predict them better with airplanes and, and everything else, all the other machinery we have. Um, machines, you know, like I said, we can irrigate, move water around to, to help us in times of drought we have heating and air conditioning times of extreme cold and and uh and and, and warmth and uh, and we've built a resilient infrastructure to deal with with major storms uh fossil fuels alex epstein says should be a climate hero not a climate villain um Climate change will only be a problem if we just throw up our hands and, and stop trying to improve technology to, to help us deal with any number of issues on this on this planet. Um, there's been there's no question about it that the that while the number of major storms and climate disasters, you know, is pretty much pretty even over time, it hasn't gone up. What but what's gone down is the number of people have been harmed or killed by major climate uh disasters so uh and and they become less of a d disaster um so what are some of the myths associated with this well obviously that carbon dioxide co2 emissions will heat the earth to such an extent that that it will become an existential threat that's a myth that's false rising co2 levels will lead to minimal warming that we can master, but that will more importantly help the world flourish by allowing more land to be able to farm, to be able to produce more food and energy in, in, in regard uh, for mankind. Um, just looking through some notes here. Um, there is no reason to severely cut back on the use of these fossil fuel heroes as a climate hero uh, that will that will disadvantage humanity far more than it might help global warming. But again, if global warming isn't a catastrophic existential threat, the models are just wrong on that, flat out wrong. Just, I mean, they've been predicting doomsday for 40, 50 years and it hasn't come yet. They're still saying it's 30, 40, 50 years out and they'll keep saying it. Common sense, common sense. Um. Another myth that warming is a bigger problem than cold. Uh, more people die from cold than they do 
from heat throughout the world. It's a fact. In fact, here is um, here is a chart that um, Alex Epstein sent in his notes. And you can see here, red are uh, heat-related deaths, blue are cold-related deaths across some of the major continents. And it's not even close, folks. It's not even close. So the little bit of warming is actually going to reduce, not increase deaths. Um, myth, future warming will accelerate as CO2 emissions rise. False, that's a false myth, the truth. Mainstream science now is unanimous. They talk about unanimous. The greenhouse effect that everybody talks about is now a is is now known to be a diminishing effect. CO2 levels are going up, but yet global temperatures are not, at least not anywhere near as fast as 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 CO2. So this connection that we once thought between carbon CO2 levels going up and global temp is, has been blown away. It's probably not the cause. It's probably the sun. It's now unanimous that the greenhouse effect or the once thought greenhouse effect is diminishing. So on and on, uh, you know, from the number of storms uh, to the number of wildfires are increasing with global warming, uh, the ecosystems will be destroyed. Uh, none of that is true. None of that is true. And I'm not going to go through each of the charts here because we only have so much time. So I want to so so given given you know just just this little attempt here to weaken the the, the perceived threat of climate change, I want to go back uh, to my uh, opinion piece in the Providence Journal, and here it is from uh, Sunday, uh, March 10th, as you can see, and. And uh, I'll go through it here with you a second, but but uh, it's time for Rhode Island lawmakers to face reality. Now, as I explained in my opinion piece, the reality is we are we have chosen as a state to follow California's emission standards, the California Air Resources Board, CARB, not coincidentally named. Um, and right now, um, they are they are proposing a ban on the sale of gasoline powered cars by the middle of next decade. The federal, now states either can choose to follow California standards or federal standards. Federal standards are a lot less. Federal standards say two thirds of all cars sold by 2032, by early next decade must be electric. Where California says 100% of vehicle sales must be electric by the middle of next decade. But even the lesser, less restrictive, less onerous, less oppressive federal standards, even the radical environmentalists, the hardcore uh, global, glo you know, climate climate change uh, believers, global warming believers, even they at the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, are saying, you know what, even our two thirds mandate by 2032 is not achievable. That's just not achievable, and we're going to backtrack. So very soon we're expecting the EPA to come out with new standards. Connecticut, just la at the end of last year, November, I think, maybe December, the governor faced with the reality, lawmakers were gonna, were gonna vote, uh, we're, we're not gonna support his push. Connecticut said, we, we, we're not gonna follow California's strict, much more strict emission standards anymore. It's just not realistic to think we can do so. It's gonna harm our people too much for no benefit and the goals are unachievable. We don't have enough electricity on the grid to power all these cars. So Connecticut, so the federal EPA is backtracking. Connecticut is backtracking out of its, uh, out of the, if you would, the multi-state coalition along with with uh, uh, California. It's now time for Rhode Island to follow the lead of the of, of the federal EPA and Connecticut and to step away. We know in California. Just 18 months ago or so, 15, they, they, the governor had to tell them not to charge your cars anymore. We don't have enough capacity on the grid. You know, it was a hot, hot spell. We didn't need air conditioning. Companies needed power for, for their machinery and whatnot. And so we, we don't have the infrastructure, either electrical grid capacity or enough uh, charging stations to support these, these levels 
of, of electric vehicle mandates. In fact, there should be no mandates at all. Why should electric vehicles not face the same uh, mm -hmm the same market uh, realities that any product would face, whether it's a refrigerator or a washing machine. Hey, if it's a good product and it's affordable and it's reliable and it's available, people will buy it. But you want to force people to buy things when there's no real threat and there's no, and there's no real emissions gains. Again, you know, where does the electricity to power your electric vehicle come from? It's not going to come primarily from wind and solar. We don't have that wind and solar aren't there yet. They, 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 it doesn't, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, you don't produce electricity. And we know that happens a lot, especially up here in the Northeast. So powering your cars often in other parts, you know, in Rhode Island, it'll come from natural gas because that's where we get most of our electricity from. But in other parts of the country, they're getting their electricity from coal. Thus, the term I've used, you know, coal powered cars, they literally are. If coal is the source of the electricity that powers your electric vehicle, then you have a coal-powered car with just a chart with just an electric, uh, you know, a, char a charger in between. So you're still creating emissions, not with the car, but with the coal or with the natural gas, as the case may be. Look, we want, we welcome green technology. When it's ready, we welcome no more emissions in the air. But what we're doing now isn't harming us. It's not creating an existential threat. Uh, we need a, a market-driven, common-sense approach to energy that allows people to continue to flourish from the benefits of fossil fuels, continue to heat their homes, continue to cool their homes, continue to power their cars in a cost effective, uh, well, I would say a low cost, high abundant and reliable way, which fossil fuels delivers. Why would we wanna go backwards towards the dark ages? Honestly, why would we wanna do that? If we try to restrict ourselves to just green energy, we're not gonna be able to heat our homes, cool our homes, drive our vehicles in an affordable or reliable way. We're just not, it's it's the fact. It's not, it's not a philosophical thing. Anybody will tell you that green energy is not ready for prime time yet. We're not ready to rely upon it. Look, we welcome, we, we welcome continued technological advances in electric cars and solar and wind. But right now, you know, we know the problems with wind killing the wildlife, the high cost. Many projects are shut down and uh, naturalists, you know, those who protect, want to protect wildlife and sea life and natural habitats. They're now at growing odds with, with the radical, you know, climate crazies with these offshore wind farms, onshore wind farms as well, which, which kill birds as well. And in addition to the offshore wind farms, you know, killing sea life and birds. And, and then the solar farms, of course, incinerate, um, incinerate a lot of birds as, as well. If you don't know that, look it up. It's true. As well as both, both of those kinds of farms take up enormous amounts of ocean or land space that 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 uh, interrupts, uh, you know, fishing and be the beautiful ocean views in the ocean, and and which take down a lot of forests and land uh, when they're used on land. We need um, we need an all of the above approach, but the truth is, the reality is, we're going to have to continue to rely on fossil fuels for decades into into the foreseeable future. Fossil fuels will necessarily play a major role in powering America for decades to come. And again, we await and welcome the developments in green energy technology. But until then, we've got to consider how do we get more natural gas into our area to increase our grid capacity? And, and should we reconsider nuclear power? Now, one of our part-time volunteers, Monique Chartier, you've heard her on the radio, you read her on Anchor Rising. She did some terrific research. She inquired with Elect uh, Rhode Island Energy, what are your current plan? What are the current plans to expand grid capacity in Rhode Island? And Monique, Monique Chartier, which I mentioned in my uh, op-ed, uh, through dogged, you know, very polite. She's always very polite, professional, but she's persistent. 
They admit it. There are no plans to expand grid capacity right now in Rhode Island. Now, it's a New England area problem. You know, it's not Rhode Island. It's not all on Rhode Island. It's, you know, it's complicated, but the way it worked, it's a New England area, something called ISO New England. Anyway, won't get into that now. But we have all these plans to increase reliance on electricity, <clears throat> more increase electric vehicles. Do we get rid of gas stoves and blowers, you know, leaf blowers and all kinds of other gas powered appliances and switch everything over to electricity, natural gas, heat, no more. If, if we're so, so there are all these plans to increase our reliance on electricity, but there are no plans to increase our electrical grid capacity. Does that make any sense? Doesn't that sound like putting the cart before the horse? So thanks to Monique Chartier for, uncovering that really they said well when the need actually apply uh, actually occurs then we'll consider plans to expand it's going to be too late by then see this is the problem with the leftists and the green energy movement all these plans all these provisions but yet they're not complete plans okay we want to be here but we, we we haven't planned for how we have the capacities to support us when we get there and that's the problem that's why we have to backtrack we have to, and Rhode Island, don't forget, has this even more unattainable goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Gina Raimondo, now supported by Dan McKee in the Department of Environmental Management here in Rhode Island, and most of them make, oh, they, they're praise, praise, praise Rhode Island. We're the first state to set a goal of having net zero emissions for a state by 2050. It's impossible. It's not possible. If electric vehicle mandates aren't possible, then net zero emissions are even more impossible. So we have to reset our thinking, make it reality-based, okay? Lawmakers have to understand this. I know, I know you're caught up in the narrative. I know you believe things that have been fed to you for decades, but it's just not true. And, and if, you, if you open your mind and, and look at the actual science, you will know that everything... I just told you everything I put in my op-ed and everything you're going to hear from my guest, Alex Epstein, uh, is absolutely true. Please, please watch this. We, we have to ensure that our residents in this state have abundant, reliable, and low-cost energy, regardless of where it comes from. Of course, preferably low emissions as well. And natural gas is low emissions and, co and coal is burning cleaner than it used to. But that's how a society flourishes. Energy powers our society. Without abundant, reliable, low-cost, low-emission energy, we can't have a powerful economy. We can't have a good economy. And people will suffer in their pocketbooks, and people will die. If we can't farm the land, if we can't heat our homes or cool our homes when necessary. So ensuring that kind of energy availability and affordability must be our state's new goal. All right, so with that, it's time to bring on now, um, really, we're honored to have him. He is the world's foremost expert on the benefits of fossil fuels, on how they have helped humanity flourish and why we need to rethink um, our narrative-driven, false narrative-driven green energy goals. Adam, let's see our interview with Alex. All right, folks, so I'm, I'm really thrilled to uh, have uh, a, really a national nationally prominent figure when it comes to energy policy and i've been looking forward to this interview for many many years believe it or not and we welcome for the first time to in the dugout alex epstein alex welcome are you in Thank california you. right now yeah in, in laguna beach yeah i like you you're very on brand i like it <laughs> with yeah, your baseball yeah, well, and your hat and well, as a former big leaguer, I figured, well, let's go with the baseball theme. So anyway, I didn't um, actually, my, I didn't right. actually know that. Well, that, I got to yeah, ask I you about that. Yeah, I played for the Expo, Expos, Twins, and Red Sox in a in a 
younger and 30 pounds ago time. <laughs> what, what, okay. I, I know this is going to be boring to your listeners, but what, when did you play for the Red Sox? I grew up a Red Sox fan. Oh, no kidding. Well, I was a member. Let me grab this here. I was a member of the 1986 American League Championship team. There's my ring. Now, I was a bench player that year. I barely got off the bench, and I was only in the big league roster for the middle few months in in the summer. I went back down. I was up and down in Pawtucket, AAA that year. But, yeah, that was my hometown team. I grew up in Rhode Island. I, I can't say I contributed to the American League Championship team very much, but I, I was on that squad with Roger Clemens and Wade Boggs and – and all those guys. So, um, yep. I guess you didn't, you didn't contribute to the loss either in the World Series either. No, I didn't. Well, you know what, Alex? I was supposed to be the defensive replacement for the older guys like Bill Buckner, you know, and and oh Jim Rice and left, you know, kind of thing. And uh, I always wondered what what if I what if that f- my prophecy was fulfilled and I would have been in first place on that faithful play. So there you go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's why I carry the baseball and all that. Hey, you might as well do it up a little bit, right? It's a little fun. But I don't. I really don't talk about it that much. Um, Alex, you were introduced to me first many years, seven, eight years ago, by a former board member of ours, who I think you know, through your Ayn Rand connections. And I'm a big Ayn Rand fan. Um, Ellen Kenner, a board member of ours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. she's great. And- yeah, Ellen is terrific. She is so dedicated. She she moved to Florida and left our board, but she always said, Mike, I got to get you in touch with Alex someday. And she did. We'll talk about that in just a second. But anyway, you are, look, you are, well, I don't even know how to describe it. You are the world's preeminent promoter and advocate of fossil fuel. It's not that you're against green energy, but you're a promoter of fossil fuels. Ellen sent me this book seven or eight, six, seven years ago. I read it. And then I become an Alex Epstein fan. Tell us about the moral case for fossil fuels. Sure. You know, I think it's it's a good point that it's not primarily against other things. It's it's for fossil fuels, but really what it's for is energy that's cost effective and scalable. So both of those are important. So cost effective, I mean affordable. So typical person can afford to use a lot of it. Reliable, it's available when needed and the quantity needed. And then it's versatile. It can power every type of machine. You know, most machines in the world are not powered by electricity. They're powered by other forms of energy, usually directly burning fossil fuels, like for transportation or heat, because that's the only way to do it cost effectively or the most cost effective way to do it. And then it needs to be scalable, available to billions of people in thousands of places. And what I focus on in, in Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and then it's, it's superseded by the newer book, Fossil Future, is if you really look at fossil fuels objectively, which means if you're carefully weighing not only the negative side effects, which is what people focus on, but you also look at the benefits, you know, the benefits far, far outweigh the negative side effects. And in fact, one unique property of fossil fuels or almost unique is the benefits actually cure the side effect. So, you, so with most, you know, take it. Right, say that again, the benefits, what? Cure, like they cure, they heal the side effects. So you think about wow. a drug, well, you think about a drug, like, you know, you take an antibiotic, and it causes a rash, and and the, and the benefit of it might be worth the rash. You know, it probably is if you're if you decided to take it. With fossil fuels, though, let's say they have a side effect of somewhat increasing the incidence of drought. Like, let's just say in some regions you have more drought because of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, et cetera. There are reasons to doubt this for the whole globe because generally a warmer world is a wetter world. But let's just say some area has more drought. Well, but fossil fuels also give you the ability to irrigate. And they also give you the ability to move crops. And so on net, you are far safer from drought than you would be without fossil fuels and their negative side effects. Whereas with the antibiotic, you're not safer from the rash, right? You can't avoid the rash. So fossil fuels actually do more to cure drought than they do to cause drought. And this is a big reason why drought-related deaths have declined by over a factor of 100 in the last century. So people don't realize this about them. What, what I love about what you write about, and I know it's a term you generally use, public policy should be about promoting and advancing human flourishing, right? Uh, I, I, I've used the term, we want to thrive, not just merely survive. So it's the same idea. Um, and fossil fuels have helped humanity flourish. There can be no argument about that. 
Well, there's not enough. So there's a few things in what you said, because one is there's not enough focus on flourishing. So that's that's one thing. If you look at the discussion, say, of fossil fuels and climate, what's what's the obsession? The obsession is we've made it somewhat warmer and that's allegedly terrible. And they'll say, yeah, like there's more heat waves and it's hard for us. It's, but they're not at all looking at the big picture. They're not looking at even is the climate more or less livable because of fossil fuels. Because if you think about that, it's obviously more livable, right? Whatever has happened with one degree Celsius, two degrees Fahrenheit of warming, like would you rather have that and mass air conditioning or have it be one degree Celsius cooler and not have air conditioning? I mean, that's anyone in the world this. And it's so obvious. Much of the U.S. is just basically uninhabitable or miserable without uh, air conditioning. I mean, you know, Phoenix and Houston in the summer and all these places. So they're just, they're not, it's not focused on human flourishing because if you're really focused on human flourishing, you look at both positives and negatives. It's just yeah. focused on, it's just You have to look at on, the cost, the cost, for, the cost versus benefit analysis. Right. You have to look and, at that, but everybody only looks at one side of this whole thing. And so part of it, and this this goes to a discussion I have in, in my book, Fossil Future, in chapter three, you have to start asking if people who should know better are only looking at one side of it. They're only right. looking at negative side effects. Like what's going on? And my argument, a big argument of mine for the knowledgeable people, not ignorant people, ignorant people just don't know, but the knowledgeable people is what's going on is they're not really concerned about negatives on humans. They're, they're concerned with what they would call negatives on the planet. But negatives on the planet, from their perspective, is just human impact. And so their basic view is that human impact is an immoral force in the world. They think of the perfect planet as one that has little to no human impact. And so they just think it's wrong for us to impact Earth. And, and the core moral premise of my work in energy and environmental and industrial issues is it is good to impact the planet insofar as it advances human flourishing. And most of the time, it's good because it does impact human flourishing for the better. Especially when that good can be achieved with such reliability, abundance, and low cost, right? Well, that's, Compared part, of the, that's part of the good is that you are, everyone gets to use machines to overcome all the natural deficiencies and dangers of Earth, which is not a good place to live for the average person at any point throughout its history until very recently, until we figured out how to empower ourselves with machines to overcome our natural weakness and to overcome the inhospitability of the planet. All right, so as we continue with this interview, if I could ask you to keep two things in mind and just openly invite you to, to, to make a relation to these two things, Rhode Island specific things as we move okay. forward. Sure. So Rhode Island is one of the CARB states. We're one of the states that is following the California uh, Air Resources Board's um, mandates uh, that we have to ban the sale of gasoline-powered vehicles, small trucks, cars, mid-sized trucks, uh, by the middle of the next decade. And Rhode Island boasts, our lawmakers boast, our governor, our speaker, our Senate president, all the activists boast that Rhode Island is set to be the first state to set to, to, to set a goal of net carbon, zero net carbon emissions by 2040 or 2050 or some ridiculous item like that. That's our public policy in this state right now. It's all from, and then, then we had this act on climate bill a few years ago. When you look at these green energy targets, and you said it earlier, and I said, it, you're not an opponent of green energy. It's just that you can't rely on it right now. But when you look at these green energy mandates and standards and goals, Alex Epstein says what? If you, you, you have to imagine my filter, which is a very strong awareness that there's nothing close to fossil fuels right now and for the foreseeable future in terms of cost effectiveness and scalability. Then, then the net zero commitment just sounds to me like, oh, Rhode Island is vowing to be really energy poor, really poor, and dramatically decrease the life expectancy of its citizens in a short amount of time. So it's the opposite of an aspiration. It's it's just a you know a, an a economic and, and literal death yeah. sentence. Yeah, yeah, it's a suicide yeah. pact, right? Yeah, of, of course. And you would think like what you would want for Rhode Island. I mean, it's not like Rhode Island is. You know, Rhode Island, I, I, you know, I would imagine, I mean, I've been there and I, I like it. You know, it's obviously a very small state and it's not super well known. Like you would like leadership of Rhode Island to say, hey, you know what? We're going to 
we're going to sort of be like Singapore, right? We're going to just totally stand out. We're going to be an energy leader. We're going to be incredibly prosperous. You're going to hear about amazing I, manufacturing coming from Rhode Island. And, and it's I, the opposite, right? It's like, we're not, nobody even knows what we're doing right now. No I offense. am so glad and, you and we're said gonna that. And we're going to do less. I am so we're gonna glad do you much said less. that. That's been what, you know what we hear around here? Hey, Massachusetts just raised its, uh, you know, its, its zero emissions goals. Or Massachusetts just raised taxes on the rich. Or Connecticut just did this. So we have to keep up with the Joneses. And I can't, wait a minute. What if we did the opposite? People would come here like crazy. Just like you said, we would stand out. This going along with the Joneses and this narrative. Let's talk about that a second. This is about narrative, right? This is not about scientific fact. We are not science deniers, are we? Uh, well, yeah, definitely not. But but the Joneses, I mean, one thing to think about there is when you're looking at the Joneses, there's a question of what led the Joneses to be successful and are they on a trajectory that you want to keep up with? And so in this case, if you look at, say, Massachusetts, New York, these places, like a lot of what's going on is they have a lot of legacy that takes a while to go on a downward glide slope, right? Like people leaving New York and people leaving Massachusetts, like they, they have, I mean, Massachusetts, for example, has all of these elite universities and all of this talent and there's all kinds of effects from that. But in general, they're doing things that are contrary to their interest. So if you don't have all those benefits and you're still copying them, that is even worse, right? So you, if you wanted to keep up with them, say, how can we be a leader like they used to be? Not you look, it's kind of like Europe. Like you want to copy Europe now or you want to copy Europe that led it to greatness in the past? Because right now it's just been a glide slope to, to doom as far as I can tell. Okay, in terms of the science... Yeah, so the science denier thing is, is wrong in, in so many ways, but maybe the one that's, maybe a way that's less apparent to people is that the key with science is it always needs to serve objective thinking. And, in, and with environmental issues, as you mentioned, there's always this cost benefit analysis. So when you're looking at, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at air pollution or CO2 emissions or something like that, you always, to use the terminology of our environmental agencies, you need to look at, okay, what are the benefits of reducing emissions by a given amount and like have real health science there? And then what are the costs? And in general, what they want to do is they only want to focus on the benefits of, of, of constraining, say, fossil fuels, and they don't want to look at the costs. And so to get around that cost-benefit discussion, they just call anyone who challenges them a science denier. Whereas right. in reality, they're science deniers, A, because they don't look at cost, which is completely anti-scientific. Yeah, that, that's B, an objective analysis, right? Yeah, and it, it B, if you look at benefits, like you look at what the EPA does, it is criminal how they inflate benefits. I'll just give you one example because I've been working on um, kind of a new energy platform for the United States. You look at how the EPA calculates the benefits of its policies. They claim that their policies save the average American household $15,000 a year. That's their view, right? They somehow are giving us $15,000 a year. They're taking credit uh, for that, whereas they're actually costing us massive amounts. But one thing they do is instead of actually showing cause and effect with different kinds of air pollutants at different levels, they just use very vague associations and just arbitrarily assert. Look, you should look for associations to find cause and effect, but associations can't blame it. Uh, and then another thing they do is they assume that any amount of any kind of emissions, whether radiation or air emissions, that any amount is toxic. But this is not how things work, right? There's always a threshold at which things are safe and which they're they're dangerous. And then finally, just one more thing is when they're calculating lives saved in this kind of thing, they actually say we get $10 million of credit even for every life that gets, every death that gets delayed, no matter how short. So if they extend, if, the, if somebody's death is delayed two days, EPA says, hey, we just got you $10 million. And this en enables them to impose they actually try catastrophic to put a monetary, costs. They actually try to put a monetary value on life? Well, but 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 if you're thinking, that's I actually it, not invalid to do. But the way they're doing it is insane, right? Because would anyone in the world pay or be able to pay for like three days of death delayed, I'm going to pay $10 million. Right. No. So you're just ripping off your neighbors, but then their death is hastened because they're poor and poverty government. is the number one inhibitor of health. Government think. Um, hey, I want to go back before we get on to electric vehicle freedom. Um, I want to go back to something you said, fossil fuels are the only energy source. What about nuclear? Well, no, I said they're, they're uniquely cost effective and scalable for the foreseeable future. The nuclear is something that had the cards been different policy-wise, 
could potentially be cost effective and globally scalable now. Uh, you know, if you look at the the late 60s, we were getting pretty right. cheap nuclear plants that were competitive. They were expanding. And then we created this thing called the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which is, in effect, the Nuclear Criminalization Commission. And that, <laughs> combined with some other factors, just totally retarded, and I mean that word literally here, uh, nuclear progress, you know, to the point where it took 48 years for one plant to go from conception to completion under the NRC regime. And that one was over budget, you know, many times over and, and terrified people. So if you if you make something infinitely expensive to build by having infinite fake safety measures, then you can't do it. And unfortunately, that's happened around the world. So nuclear is has huge potential, but it's still in a primitive and, and in many ways stagnating state. All right. But are you but just Quickly, yes or no, because I want to move on. But are you a supporter of nuclear energy for America's well, future? Uh, well, I'm a supporter of the freedom to develop and use. So I'm a favor of, okay. in favor of li okay. liberating nuclear. That's the key. Fair. Not subsidizing. Free market, freedom. Yeah, freedom of choice, market determined. Yep, I get it. Yeah. I'm with you on that. Yes. All right. I had a op-ed, as it turns out, just published uh, last, this past Sunday in the Providence Journal. Oh, nice. Journal. Uh, and uh, and it's gotten some pretty good play. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Rhode Island is uh, on track to follow California's rule to ban the sale of gasoline particle vehicles and force people to buy more expensive, less reliable electric vehicles. You you you've been promoting a concept called you know the case for uh, electric vehicle freedom. Talk about electric vehicles, electric vehicle mandates, and that whole issue. So it's just kind of like if someone came out with a new kind of phone, right? You would say, okay, well, if your phone is good, then sell it to people, offer it on the market and see what happens. We seem to lose sight of this with energy, that there's such a thing as freedom and consumer choice and producer competition. These are very time-tested dynamics uh, for good for good reason. Uh, yeah, and kind so of built what, our country, didn't they? Those dynamics yeah, built 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 the, the prosperity of it. <laughs> and so, what what you have with EVs that should be a red flag for people is that supposedly they're they're superior, and yet they need to be forced on us. So, you look at what Biden has been trying to do with the EPA, trying to get two, one half to two thirds of us to forcibly buy EVs. You know, by the early twenty thirties, right? So, just this huge scale up of this stuff. And the reason they're coercing it is because it's not actually in the interest of most Americans to buy. And there are two basic reasons for this. One is they're still not the most cost effective option for most people If you, because there's the cost of them, which is still quite high. But there's also the effectiveness. They have issues with range. They have issues with charge time. People, you know, we were just buying a, a family car and, you know, we think about it. And my wife is particularly concerned. Hey, I don't want something that I have to go to a chart that, you know, I'm not sure if we can go on a long trip with. People are make like, I have no opposition to EVs. I, I'd be willing right. to get one if it were they're just great cars. Easy. Yeah. But, but, but they're limited. They lack some of the functionality of the cars we're used to. But they also don't solve climate change well, potential well, crisis, we, we, right? We could, we, could, we could talk about that, but that's that's not my main concern because I don't think there's a, I don't think having a slightly warmer planet is a crisis. Um, right. But the, okay, got but, it. but the other thing, the thing that is a crisis, so there's the issue of you're forcing people to use things that aren't cost effective, and that's obviously going to hurt the middle class and especially the poor most of all, because they're going to either have inferior mobility or lack of mobility. Uh, but the, the kind of worst thing for everyone is we're putting enormous pressure, demand pressure on a grid that is already very supply constrained. So if you look at, right. say, national, like the, the Reliability Corporation, of NERC, what's called NERC, uh, they are warning about, you know, insufficient electricity throughout the country, all over the place. We're having shortages and shortages because people are trying to shut down reliable fossil fuel and nuclear plants and then replace them with unreliable solar and wind. And we're getting warnings even from the government who's not warning about it enough. They're warning about it. And then we're gonna put way more demand. So we artificially decrease the supply of electricity, artificially increase demand for electricity. That is a crisis that is in process right now. All right, we've talked about how California, Governor Newsom himself said, hey, if you have an electric vehicle, don't charge it. This was like 15 months ago when they were or yeah. 18 months ago when they going through a heat wave. We didn't have, they didn't have enough electricity on the grid. And they said, hey, please don't yeah, charge it. Yeah, I was there. Right. I was you there. there. DeSantis, right. DeSantis, there. Pointed that, DeSantis pointed that out in that debate that they had, which is a really right. good point. You know, six days after you say no more, everyone's got to use an EV. It said, oh, don't charge your electric car. And by the way, they also say, don't use your air conditioning during summer. Like this is life under these guys. 
I, hey, two more Rhode Island related issues I'd like to bring up with you if you have a few more minutes, Alex. And thank yeah. you for being here. I think I think well, let's have a little fun with this one. Okay. You've had some sparring matches. I don't know if they've ever been in person, but certainly in articles and social media. Oh, yeah, they've been in person, too. With Rhode Island Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, Oh, yeah. You actually told him to resign (laughs) at one point many years ago for vilifying the fossil fuel industry. Talk about Sheldon Whitehouse and his obsession with climate change. It was definitely not for... Uh, it was definitely not for vilifying them. It was for uh, it was for actually suppressing their right to free speech. So it was actually for violating the Constitution. I said if you violate the Constitution, it, and you don't, it, you should resign. And and he never responded to that directly. Uh, although I think he was there. But Barbara Boxer was not none too pleased with it. And she's like, oh, how could you claim this? But I said, wait, if you violate the Constitution, you should resign. So if you look at this whole movement to go after the idea was. Exxon should be prosecuted by the government for not saying that we faced a climate crisis in the 80s. And the idea is there were certain people in the company who believed that we faced a climate crisis, and therefore Exxon should have said that. Well, first of all, why does the fact that some people in a company believe something mean that the whole company should voice it? But also, the company has a right to free speech. They are allowed to express their opinions. The only way the government should get involved is if they are committing fraud. And the only way they can commit fraud is by concealing or distorting information they have unique access to. The issue of climate and CO2 emissions, they do not have unique access to. This is an issue that is funded by uh, and publicized by the government. It's like saying, oh, gravity, like you can commit fraud about gravity because you're not talking about the like. Except in this case, it's not gravity because it's not well established and precisely. But White House tried to restrict their speech. Of course, that's what he was going after. That that's what he was doing at the time. And actually, they started Maura Healy. This is, I think, she's Massachusetts Attorney General at the time. You know, they went after me as well. So they just suspected incorrectly. It, it turned out, but they suspected that somehow Exxon had been corresponding with me and working with me on these issues, which was not true. But anyway, I was named in a subpoena of Exxon. Uh, and I thought this is just totally outrageous. Like they're demanding the right to to go through alleged correspondence with me. It turned out it didn't exist. But based on what they, they have free speech. So I I wrote to her and it was I won't say it because it involved profanity, but it was blank off fascist. And then they got really upset about that. I was like, you're not you should not. This is just total fascism that you think you can just violate you can just search people's records violate the right to free speech because they express a climate opinion you disagree with what what country is this wow well they t- they did take it to the court so i'm i'm going to bring up one thing i know you know and the second thing i you probably know but i'm not sure so as you know sheldon whitehouse our former attorney general former governor all got together and rhode island became the first state to sue you mentioned uh, Exxon, but they sued Exxon and Chevron and big oil for climate change related catastrophes, of which there are none, in in our state. So there is a lawsuit. I'm, I'm sure you're quite aware of that lawsuit, correct? I mean, I'm aware of these. There's many of these lawsuits, unfortunately. All right. Well, Rhode Island was the first state to sue. And there was a battle <laughs> for many years, whether it should be in federal jurisdiction or state jurisdiction. And of course, we here in the Northeast we have a left-wing judiciary, and they, after years of battle, ended up being uh, assigned to state court, which is much more left-leaning and biased. But here's the thing: I, I like to know if you know about, if not, just comment on. Last summer, it was revealed. Well, the judge in the case, a guy named a Superior Court Justice uh, Carnes in Rhode Island, basically in public comments cited left-wing arguments from left-wing websites about climate change almost as if he was prejudging the case against big oil. Okay, first, that's the first point. What we learned right before the new year, I can't remember the name of the group, but a group, they claim to have had seminars and meetings and educational courses with about 1,700 judges across the country to educate them on the real dangers of climate change. So these climate change activists out there literally 
trying to influence our court system and the judges who, who are supposed to be objectively adjudicating these cases. Are you aware of that? And if not, yes. even if you are, what are your comments on that? Yeah, I commented on this on TV a while back. This it's it's really ominous. I mean, let's just talk about this whole thing. Like, oh. what are what are we suing Exxon over? They they did a legal action, right? So the, again, the climate issue is a publicly known issue. We had a policy where we are choosing to use fossil fuels as consumers. Industries choose to use them. Companies are responding to that demand. That's what Exxon did, right? They produced something that we demanded. It was a legal thing. How can you possibly sue them? For that, like you don't have a right to do that. They didn't do anything illegal. And then on top of this, it's doubly absurd because the energy that they provided us has allowed us to become far safer from climate. We have publicly known disaster death data that shows that climate disaster deaths have declined massively because all the benefits we get from fossil fuels making us resilient have protected us far more from climate than there's been any kinds of new climate challenges. So it doesn't make sense on top of that. And, and then the, you always point out more people die across the world from cold than they do from heat. Right, right. So on top of that, yeah, warming on its own is is better in terms of avoiding death than, than cooling. Uh, and then more of the warming occurs in colder regions. So it's even more beneficial to have warming just on those grounds alone. So but then so what you're getting is judges being trained in climate catastrophism, an essential of which is fossil fuel benefit denial. So this is the real denial that nobody's talking about the benefits of fossil fuels, including all the climate related benefits. But you can't make a rational climate assessment if you deny the ability of fossil fuels to protect us from drought and storms and heat and cold. You can't possibly think of that. And again, it'd be like you're just looking at antibiotics, negative side effects, but not benefits. So we're having judges being made totally ignorant, but they think it's science because the, what right. they call science is a totally illogical way of thinking about things and then only looking at negatives and then exaggerating negatives. That's that's the opposite of science. Wow. Um, all right, let's wrap up this way, uh, Alex, and thank you for your time today. I, I'd like you to give you as much little or as much time as you like. Speak to Rhode Island lawmakers about the electric vehicle mandate tied to CARB about their net zero carbon emissions policy, which would force 100% green energy resources on the people of this state in the next uh, 20 years or so. Talk directly to lawmakers. What is the realistic approach they should take towards energy policy? So, so the current approach you're taking is a, an approach of punishing Rhode Island to achieve symbolism, right? That's the current approach, right? So you're, I, I mentioned why I think it's a death sentence to do all these things. It's important though that it's, it is important, particularly insofar as you're concerned about CO2 type issues, that it is symbolic, right? Because the world is not gonna follow Rhode Island. Rhode Island is a tiny user of energy. The nation isn't even gonna follow Rhode Island, but certainly the world isn't gonna follow our nation insofar as we self-sacrificially sabotage our energy. Look at China. China has 300 plus new coal plants in the pipeline. That's way more than we even have total right now in the US, right? So the world is generally going to pursue energy that's cost effective and scalable. If you are trying to be a leader in lowering emissions, the one and only thing you can do that matters and that is good. You could kill yourself, but that is bad and you could ruin your people's lives. That's bad. And that's not going to scale anyway. That's not a human flourishing, is it? Yeah, right, right. But the, the one and only thing you can do is you can innovate in alternatives. And the way you can innovate in alternatives is you create an incredibly good political environment, including, by the way, very low cost energy, so that people can innovate. So if I were running new, uh, and I'm happy to help with this, I advise, you know, hundreds of politicians at this at this uh, time, I will help you with, you should try to become a leader in nuclear and basically say, hey, Rhode Island is gonna be a new place where we are gonna be a pioneer in nuclear energy. And we are gonna demand that the federal government give us freedom to experiment this. We're gonna become a hotbed for this in the good sense of the term, right? We're gonna be the place where energy innovation happens. And then just get rid of all that other crap, which is just gonna ruin people's lives and accomplish nothing. And then that way you'll be a much more prosperous state and you actually have a shot at doing something by your professed goal. But right now you are just ruining everyone's lives or you're, you're planning to, and you're, it's just symbolism. So why would you wanna be, go out as somebody who just ruined everything and accomplished nothing by any standard except for the standard of human misery? 
So my email is alex at alexepstein.com. If you're a lawmaker, feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll help you do the right thing. I mean, Alex, it, what you just said is complete common sense, but yet these false narratives from the left continue to rule the day, continue to dominate the thinking of lawmakers. Have you found a way to break through these narratives with, with facts and common well, sense? I mean, I, I work with a lot of lawmakers. I mean, my basic policy is I'll work with anyone of any party. They just have to be open to doing what I think is the right thing, which is ultimately what I call energy freedom. So I am finding a lot of success persuading people. And I would say to your audience, if you want success as well, uh, check out, I have an energy talking points newsletter. So alexepstein.substack.com. There's an energy talking points newsletter. And then part of that is actually, we have a chat bot called Alex AI, which answers questions as me. So if you want to become a more effective energy advocate, just sign up for that free newsletter and you'll get a ton of, like you'll get all the talking points you need to persuade other people. He is Alex Epstein. He's got a he's got an AI app. Look it up. What's the name of the AI app again? Ask Alex. It, it, it's 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 Alex. It's Alex AI. Don't search for that in the app store. If you just search like Alex Epstein AI, it should come up because Alex AI. You'll I'll just get All beaten right. by he's Alexa. He's got a new book out, Fossil Future. He's got a newsletter, uh, Alex at alexepstein.com. Is that what it was? Well, yeah, the, newsle the newsletter is alexepstein.substack.com. And then, yeah, my email is alex at alexepstein.com. Right. And in particular, I'm eager for any politicians to email me if you want to make uh, Rhode Island have a good future instead of copying the bad future of your neighbors. You are the world's foremost uh, advocate for fossil fuels like me. Hey, when, when green energy is market friendly and, and ready for prime time, we're all for it. But for, for now, we've got to we can't we've got to pull off this voodoo hex that everybody's been putting on fossil fuels. And you you have explained it better than anybody I've ever heard of. So, Alex Epstein, thank you for joining me here in the talk. Oh, thanks for being a Red Sox fan. That's great. I don't know. I don't know what to look <laughs> yeah, forward to. 2000. 2000, yeah, 2004 was uh, was nice. Well, Terry Francona, you know that name, of course. Yeah, of course. He was my minor league roommate, one of my good friends. Oh, wow. All and the right. Montreal well, Expos. Was... He was my teammate with the Expos, my minor league roommate, and I know Terry very, very well. So, um, hey, thanks again, Alex, for your time today. Thanks, Mike. Our audience, thank you again. We're in the dugout. Mike Stenhouse out. We'll see you all next game.